Good evening, everyone. It's time for more installments of Candace Bushnell's Sex in the City. We are on chapter two. I'm going to do chapter two and three because they're short chapters. I'm Megan Fox, by the way. I write with pjmedia.com during my day job where I write about politics and stuff. And then I come here and I get to have fun with you. Now, my microphone broke earlier today, but it wasn't actually the mic. It was the settings on my computer that got weird. Sometimes Macs do that. Like all of a sudden the settings just like turned off my output. So I spent like the last three hours dealing with that. But the good news is that my microphone is not broken. So I can do this. And also my hair is back to normal. And so I'm very, very happy with that. I decided to wash it a day early because um, I couldn't, I couldn't stand the straightness anymore. It was bothering me. I'm a curly girl and that's the way I like it. Okay. So chapter two. Now this is quite a um, <laughs> graphic no, uh, chapter. So I'm going to have to do some self-censoring because while YouTube allows some of this stuff, I don't want to get a strike or anything. So there will be a couple of words I'm going to have to not say. You're just going to have to use your imagination or follow along with me if you have your own book. Um, but, you know, I'm sure you'll be able to figure it out. All right. Chapter two, swing in sex. I don't think so. <laughs> oh, I've got my Manhattan too. And my ice maker broke. All the things that are breaking in my house, I swear to God, <laughs> I'm on my fifth week of having a broken washing machine because the parts are sitting somewhere out on a barge in a harbor. And um, so I've had to go to the laundromat for five weeks. Now, I realize that people go to the laundromat all the time and I, I applaud you. Those of you who have to go to the laundromat, God, it's the worst. Actually, it's not that bad. It's like quiet time. I get to go have quiet time, but the lugging of the laundry is the worst. Anyway, so I was talking about my, my ice maker because my Manhattan's very small tonight because I literally only have three ice cubes left. <laughs> and I might have overdone it the other night with the Manhattan, which I told you, you have to be very, very careful with. Um, yeah. Mm. It's a tasty drink, but don't overdo it. Anyway, yeah, I only have three ice cubes left. My ice, now my ice cube maker of my refrigerator quit working. <laughs> Yay me. It's an appliance extravaganza <laughs> of disappointment. All right, let's get to the book. It all started the way it always does, innocently enough. I was sitting in my apartment, having a sensible lunch of crackers and sardines. Who eats that? Gross. When I got a call from an acquaintance. A friend of his had just gone to Les Trapeze, a couples-only sex club, and was amazed. Blown away. There were people naked, having sex right in front of him. Okay, that sounds like a nightmare for me. <laughs> this is not something I ever want to see. No. Actually, this reminds me of a story that I wrote about in my book. I know that seems impossible, but the book that I wrote about this war with the library that I had, uh, this is called Shut Up, the Bizarre War that one public library waged against the First Amendment. There's a part in this book about a senator in Illinois whose wife there's this, there was this public divorce and his wife uh, uh, divorced him. And it was when Obama was running for, for office. And this guy was taking, I'm sorry, Obama wanted to run for the Senate seat, but he hadn't yet. And this guy was the Senator and they got him to resign from running because they opened up his divorce records and inside the divorce records, it was an allegation from his ex-wife who was a movie star. The one who played, her name was Jerry Ryan. Her allegation against her husband was that he took her to a sex club in Paris while they were married. I mean, he might be the only politician alive. Jack Ryan. I think his name is Jack. Yeah, Jack Ryan. Might be the only politician alive who has ever had to resign from wanting to have sex with his own wife. <laughs> I never heard of anything so nuts in my whole life. This is a true story. It's in my book. Uh, you can buy it on Amazon. But Jerry Ryan, she was in Star Trek, I think. Star Trek. Yeah, one of those things in space. She was super hot. I really, really, my husband loves her, like some blonde girl with really big tatas. All right, anyway. Okay. Unlike S&M clubs where no actual sex occurs, this was the real juicy tomato. <laughs> I love that descriptor. It's funny. The guy's girlfriend was kind of freaked out, although 
when another naked woman brushed against her and she sort of liked it, according to him. In fact, the guy was so into the place that he didn't want me to write about it because he was afraid that, like most decent places in New York, it would be ruined by publicity. I started imagining all sorts of things. Beautiful, young, hard body couples. Oh yeah, no. No, that's never, that is never the case. When you are at a uh, any of these like nudist, like a nudist colony or whatever, you know, people tell these stories, but then you get uh, photographs of them and they're like, they're always pudgy. And they're always the people you don't, you didn't want to see naked. <laughs> Isn't there a Seinfeld about that? I feel like there is. I started imagining all sorts of things, beautiful, young, hard body couples, shy, touching girls with long, wavy blonde hair wearing wreaths made of grape leaves, <laughs> boys with perfect white teeth wearing loincloths made of grape leaves, me wearing a super short, over the shoulder grape leaf dress. We would walk in with our clothes on and walk out enlightened. The club's answering machine brought me back to reality with a thump. At Le Trapeze, there are no strangers, only friends you haven't met, said a voice of indeterminate, indeterminate gender, which added that there was a juice bar and a hot and cold buffet. Things I rarely associate with sex or nudity. <laughs> what he, what, what, mm. <laughs> yeah, you don't go to a buffet naked? <laughs> Why not? <laughs> oh, it's funny. In celebration of Thanksgiving, Oriental Night would be held on November 19th. You can't say that anymore, by the way. We don't use the word Oriental to describe food or people. Um, that sounded interesting, except it turned out that Oriental Night meant Oriental food and not Oriental people. I should have dropped the whole idea right then. I shouldn't have listened to the scarily horny Sally Tisdale, who in her yuppie porn book, Talk Dirty to Me, enthuses about public group sex. This is a taboo in the truest sense of the word. If sex clubs do what they aim to do, then falling away will happen. Yes, as it is feared. No. Yes, as is feared. A crumbling of boundaries. The center will not hold. I should have asked myself, what's fun about that? <laughs> I have to say, the crumbling of boundaries is my worst nightmare. Boundaries are good, people. Boundaries. Please keep the boundaries intact. We live in a society of way too much information and way too much boundary crossing. I like boundaries. And I don't like naked people at buffets. <laughs> I'm going to agree with Candace on that one. But I had to see it for myself. And so, on a recent Wednesday night, my calendar listed two events, 9 p.m. dinner for the fashion designer Carl Lagerfield, Bowery Bar, and 11.30 p.m. Le Trapeze Sex Club, East 27th Street. Messy women knee socks. Everyone, it seems, likes to talk about sex. And the Carl Lagerfeld dinner, packed with glam models and the expense-accounted fashion editors, was no exception. In fact, it got our end of the table worked up in a near frenzy. One stunning young woman with dark curly hair and the sort of the sort of seen seen it all attitude that only twenty year olds can pull off claims she liked to spend her time going to topless bars, but only seedy ones like Billy's topless because the girls were real. Then everyone agreed that small breasts were better than fake breasts, and a survey was taken. Who among the men at the table had actually been with a woman who had silicone implants? While no one admitted it, one man, an artist, in his mid-thirties, didn't deny it strongly enough. <laughs> You've been there, accused another man, a cherub-faced and very successful hotelier. And the worst thing is, you liked it. No, I didn't, the artist protested, but I didn't mind it. Luckily, the first course arrived and everyone filled up their wine glasses. Next round. Are messy women better in bed? The hotelier had a theory. If you walk into a woman's apartment and nothing's out of place, you know she's not going to want to stay in bed all day and order in Chinese food and eat it in bed. I don't want to eat Chinese food in bed. I make the whole bedroom smell like Chinese food. I guess if you only have one, like a small apartment in New York, I, I guess. Uh, she's going to make you get up and eat 
toast at the kitchen table. And if you're Charlotte, it's midnight toast. <laughs> midnight toast. Mm. I wasn't quite sure how to respond to this because I've, I'm literally the messiest person in the world. And I probably have some old containers of General Chow's special chicken lying under my bed at this moment. Gross. Unfortunately, all of it was eaten alone. So much for that theory. Steaks were served. The thing that really drives me crazy, said the artist, is when I see a woman wearing one of those tartan skirts with high knee socks. I can't work all day. No, countered the hotelier. The worst thing is when you sort of follow a woman down the street and she turns around and she is as beautiful as you thought she was going to be. It represents everything you'll never have in your life. The artist leaned forward. I once stopped working for five years because of a woman, he said. Silence. No one could top that. The chocolate mousse arrived, and so did my date for Les Trapeze. Since Les Trapeze admits couples only, meaning a man and a woman, so it was a straight club, obviously, I had asked my most recent ex-date, Sam, an investment banker, to accompany me. Sam was a good choice, because number one, he was the only man I could get to go with me. <laughs> number two... He was the only man I could get to go with, or, or he had already had experience with this kind of thing. A million years ago, he had gone to Plato's retreat. A strange woman had come up to him and pulled out his unmentionable. His girlfriend, whose idea it had been to go there, ran screaming from the club. The talk turned to the inevitable. What kind of people go to a sex club? I seem to be the only one who didn't have a clue. Although no one had been to a sex club, everyone at dinner firmly asserted the club goers would generally be losers from New Jersey. <laughs> Someone pointed out that going to a sex club is not the kind of thing you can just do without a pretty good excuse. Example, if it's part of your job. This talk wasn't making me feel any better. I asked the waiter to bring me a shot of tequila. Sam and I stood up to go. A writer who covers popular culture gave us the last piece of advice. It's going to be pretty awful, he warned, although he had never been to such a place himself. Unless you take control. You've got to take control of the place. You've got to make it happen. Night of the Sex Zombies. <laughs> this is where the uh, self-centering is going to come in. Le Trapeze was located in a white stone building covered with graffiti. The entrance was discreet, with a rounded metal railing, a downmarket version of the entrance to the Royalton Hotel. A couple was coming out as we were going in, and when the woman saw us, she covered her face with the collar of her coat. Is it fun? I asked. She looked at me in horror and ran to a taxi. <laughs> That's not a good first sign. <laughs> Inside, a dark-haired young man wearing a striped rugby shirt was sitting in a small booth. He looked like he was about 18. He didn't look up. Do we pay you? It's $85 a couple. Do you take credit cards? Cash only. Can I have a receipt? No. <laughs> so much for writing it off. We had to sign cards saying we would abide by the rules of safe sex. We got temporary membership cards, which reminded us that no prostitution, no cameras, and no recording devices would be allowed inside. While I was expecting steamy sex, the first thing we saw were steaming tables. The aforementioned hot and cold buffet. <laughs> Nobody was eating. And there was a sign above the buffet that said, you must have your lower torso covered to eat. <laughs> God. <laughs> then we saw the manager, Bob, a burly bearded man in a plaid shirt and jeans who looked like he should have been managing Pets R Us <laughs> in Vermont. Bob told us, Bob told us the club had survived for 15 years because of its discretion. Also, he said, here, no means no. He told us not to be worried about being voyeurs, that most people start off that way. What did we see? Well, <laughs> there was a big room with a huge air mattress upon which a few blobby couples gamely went at it. There was a sex chair, unoccupied, that looked like a spider. There was a chubby woman <laughs> in a robe sitting next to a jacuzzi smoking. There were couples with glazed eyes, night of the living sex zombies, I thought, 
and there were many men who appeared to have to be having trouble keeping up their end of the bargain. <laughs> but mostly, there were those damn steaming buffet tables containing what mini hot dogs? And unfortunately, that's pretty much all you need to know. Les trapeze was, as the French say, les rip off. <laughs> By 1 a.m., people were going home. A woman in a robe informed us that she was from Nassau County and said we should come back Saturday night. Saturday night, the woman said, is a smorgasbord. I didn't ask if she was talking about the clientele. I was afraid she meant the buffet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Talking dirty at Mortimer's. A couple of days later, I was at a ladies' luncheon at Mortimer's. Once again, the talk turned to sex and my experience at the sex club. Didn't you love it? asked Charlotte, the English journalist. Okay, so Charlotte in this story is the English journalist from chapter one. I'd love to go to a place like that. Didn't it turn you on watching all those people having sex? Nope, I said, stuffing my mouth with a corn fritter topped with salmon eggs. Why not? Well, you couldn't really see anything, I explained. And the men? Well, that was the worst part, I said. Half of them look like shrinks. I'll never be able to go to therapy again without imagining a bearded fat man <laughs> lying naked and glassy-eyed on a mat on the floor getting an hour-long oral experience and still not being able to finish. <laughs> yes, I told Charlotte. We did take our clothes off, but we wore towels. No, we didn't have sex. No, I didn't get turned on. Even when a tall, attractive, dark-haired woman in her mid-thirties entered the rumpus room and caused a stir. She exposed her bottom like a monkey, and within minutes she was lost in a tangle of arms and legs. It should have been sexy, but all I could think about were those National Geographic nature films about mating baboons. God, there is, this is just so awful. Oh, the truth is, exhibitionism and voyeurism are not mainstream events, and neither, for that matter, is S&M, despite what you may have recently read elsewhere. The problem, in the clubs anyway, always comes down to the people. They're the actresses who can never find work, the failed opera singers, painters, and writers, the lower management men who will never get to the middle, people who, should they corner you in a bar, will keep you hostage with tales of their ex-spouses and their digestive troubles. They're the people who can't negotiate the system. They're on the fringes, sexually and in life. They're not necessarily the people with whom you want to share your intimate fantasies. Well, the people at La Trapeze weren't all pale, pudgy sex zombies. Before we left the club, Sam and I ran into the attention-grabbing tall woman and her date in the locker room. The man had a clean-cut, all-American face and was talkative. He was from Manhattan, he said, and had recently started his own business. He and the woman had been colleagues, he said. As the woman slipped into a yellow business suit, the man smiled and said, she fulfilled her fantasy tonight. The woman glared at him and stalked out of the locker room. A few days later, Sam called and I screamed at him. Then he asked, hadn't the whole thing been my idea? <laughs> then he asked, hadn't I learned anything? And I said, yes, I had. I told him that I learned that when it comes to sex, there's no place like home. But then you knew that, didn't you? Didn't you, Sam? <laughs> You know, I was going to read chapter three, but actually we're at 18 minutes. And so that works out. We'll just, we'll wait for chapter three for the next time. It's Friday night. It's pizza night with my, my kids anyway. So I'm going to go and have pizza. And, um, mm, that was funny. That was funny. Um, I, I thought that the, I think that I've never been to a place like that and I would never go because I already know <laughs> that that is, um, that's I always I often feel that a lot of this stuff that people are super into is always better left for imagination. You know, so much of it, so much of it. Same thing with like the nudist colonies and all this. It's better left in your imagination because the real thing <laughs> is just something no one wants to see. So tell me what you thought in the comments below. Let me know what you thought about this chapter. And I hope you're enjoying the series. And don't forget to like and subscribe. And I'll talk to you again soon.